But for now, I think it's probably best that I hand over to, to the man himself, uh, Mr. Dilja. Are you there? I am here, Dan. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to give my second lecture for Wildlife Worldwide. I gave one last year in the height of lockdown. COVID was taking control, but it didn't con take control of Wildlife Worldwide because I managed to get quite a few trips in, as Dan said, to some set levels, Mull, Speyside, which is probably one of my favourite destinations. But I want to talk to you tonight about Ecuador. I've been scheming behind the scenes with Dan and his colleague Chris to try and sort out an amazing trip to Ecuador, which we're grafting away and we're very much hoping is going to come good in April 2024. And uh, we've already got dates in. Um, it's a country I know incredibly well. Um, it's probably the second favourite country of mine. I suppose if you count Britain as one country, I know it's England, Scotland, Ireland and Northern Ireland and Wales. Uh, but if you count Britain, Ecuador is very much my second favourite country. And I'm um, really excited to be talking to, uh, talking to the guys at um, Wildlife Wide to get this trip all sorted out. And we're almost there. We're in really good shape. Um, for those of you that don't know me, frankly, you're a disgrace. Obviously, quite a few of you, I'm sure, have met me on either my space side or Mull or Somerset Levels or Shetland trips. But um, I suppose I'm best known for working on the one show. Um, I've been on it for 13, 14 years. I've done something like 450 films, uh, pontificating about everything from bumblebees to basking sharks. So I suppose many people, when they see me on television, think I'm a British expert. And I do know my wildlife pretty well. I've just done three back-to-back -back trips in the levels, came back two days ago. Amazing stuff. Shorty and owls, great white egrets, um, all manner of stuff like that. But I spent a lot of time prior uh, to the one show and prior to my career with Wildlife Worldwide, working in the tropics. Look at that. That's a collector's item, that is. That is Mike Dilger with three snakes, with a six pack, and still a little bit of hair on his head. Uh, this is me in Ecuador back in the day. I probably spent a year and a half working in this fabulous country. And um, it's, it's just biodiversity off the Richter scale. My two favorite words in the world, um, next to saying yes, when Dan offers me a trip to New Guinea, um, are uh, biodiversity and endemism. I mean, you're talking about biodiversity, biological diversity. Ecuador has it all. I mean, we've got three species of snake in Britain. We've got adder, grass snake, and smooth snake. And I'm not dissing Britain, but look here. In about 10 minutes, I found three snakes. There's a small boa constrictor on my neck, I've got a rat snake in my left hand and a fur de lance, a venomous snake in my right hand. So it's got biodiversity off the Richter scale. So um, I was working there, I first went there when I was doing my, bio, my master's degree in ecology. Um, you do a big project after your master's degree. And uh, one of the ex-students was worked out in Ecuador and said, do this current crop of students want to do a project in Ecuador? And three of us stuck up our hand and I did a project in the cloud forests of Ecuador, looking at the biodiversity of Macrolepidoptera, which is basically looking at the diversity of moths. And I took two traps, put one tra trap in the cloud forest, and another trap in a completely deforested area, and came to the stunning collection. You get more, more moths in the rainforest than you do in the pasture lands. But I had an amazing time there. And that's where Ecuador really got under my skin. And I've been, I've been back since. So I've spent about a year and a half in the country, going to a lot of the places that we're planning with this trip with Wildlife Worldwide. So for those of you that don't know the country, uh, you're looking at South America there, and that little pink blob on the west side, wedged between Colombia and Peru, is Ecuador. It straddles the equator. So Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru all straddle the big letter M that is the Andes. But also as well, all three of those countries have got a big chunk of Amazon rainforest. So if we show you um, a really interesting geological, not sorry, geological, uh, sorry, um, an altitudinal map of Ecuador, you can see the Pacific out, out to the west by Manta and Puerto Viejo. And then you come inland, there's coastal forest there. And then you hit the Andes, this big backbone running the whole way down South America. And as I said, it's like a letter M. So if you're coming in from the Pacific side, from the coastal forest, 
you hit the Western Cordilleras, right over the tops of the mountains, drop into the Inter-Andean Corridor, go up the Eastern Cordilleras, drop right down that side of the M, and then you've got rainforest. So everything right that's green of the big brown area, that's the Andes, is the Amazon rainforest. It's got a massive big chunk. And we'll certainly be taking in quite a few of those habitats during our time um, there. I mean, what we're planning is a 16 day trip. So 14 days where you get a chance to sample cloud forest, you get a chance to sample the Inter-Andean corridors, the Paramo, and then you go to Amazonia, El Oriente, the Amazon. Uh, and I'm really excited to go back. I was there in April, um, went to the Galapagos, but I don't know, Galapagos. Some people like the African plains, some people like the polar regions, some people like islands. I'm a jungle bunny. I really, really love the forests. And I got a chance to go back into the cloud forest when I was there in April of 2022. So the first place we'll go when we land is Quito, which is one of the highest uh, cities in the world. I think, but I think La Paz in Bolivia has the highest record. That's over 3,000. But Quito's 2,850. So when you get there, you have to take it easy for a day or so because you're really quite high. You're talking twice as high as anywhere in the British Isles, double Ben Nevis's altitude. But don't forget, you're sitting just a tiny smidge below the equator, half a degree below the equator. So um, it, obviously the air is going to be thinner there and you have to just ease yourself in gently. But it's a fascinating city and we'll get a chance to go to and from Quito during our time there. Um, so if I go to a map of, um, of Ecuador, uh, I've got a, an arrow there and you should be able to see a sign saying Maki Pacuna. So you can see Quito, the capital, and Maki Pacuna is a place I probably know better than anywhere else outside Speyside and Somerset Levels because I lived there for well over a year. And that's the first, first place we're hoping to visit when we, go, um, when we go out there. So we'll spend a day in Quito, getting our breath back, enjoying the Quito Old Town, Quito New Town. And then we'll take a short drive, about two and a half, three hours, maybe a little bit longer if we stop, uh, up to um, the Cloud Forest. I mean, look at that. that just, just drink that picture in. It's absolutely beautiful. So the Cloud Forest, or what they call in Spanish, because my Spanish is fluent, is Bosque Tropical Nublado. Bosque is forest, tropical is tropical, and Nublado is cloudy. So what happens is if you're, if you're a, droplet of, a droplet of rain, you're in the Pacific, you, the prevailing westerlies push you on, and then you hit the Andes, you will join up with all the other rain droplets. You, you're forced up and then you condense and you sit as cloud in the forest. That's a really characteristic scene that you'll see in the cloud forest at Maki Pacuna. The cloud is actually sitting in the canopy. So it's a really moist place. Also as well, it's quite what they call pendiente. It is a place is quite steep. It's not, not like the Amazon rainforest where quite often it's just flat, like a billiard table. We're kind of talking quite a few slopes, but there are paths that are easier and paths that are more difficult that take us into the high altitude cloud forest as well. So it's forest on slopes, which is absolutely beautiful. And that's a scene when you wake up from your cabana in Maki Bakuna, you may well see the cloud sitting in the forest. It's absolutely stunning. So we drive there, and then the first thing we see is the bridge over the river. Just through the trees at the back there, you can see the lodge at Maki Bakuna. And that's where I lived. I spent a lot of time, I played a lot of chess there. Uh, that's why I'm good at chess, if anybody wants to game. Um, and uh, love, love the whole place. You're right in the heart of the forest, just on the edge, right by this fantastic river or rio. And as you're walking across the, the commute to work from where we get to take our vehicle to where we have our cabanas and our rooms is about 50 meters. So you go across the bridge and you're looking down for Pato Torriente, the torrent duck. Now I've seen the torrent ducks quite a lot on the river down below and you can often watch them. They're amazing in the water. They're like dippers, but they're ducks, if you know what I mean. Um, and quite often in ducks, I've just been showing on the Somerset levels, gadwall, widgeon, teal, shoveler, where the males are beautiful and the females are dull, boring to look at. That's not the case with the torrent duck. I mean, look at the female on the left. She's black, she's orange, she's absolutely beautiful. So they're sexually dimorphic, the ducks are different, and they're very, very happy when the water's bubbling away and frothy. 
So when you're there, when you're when you're sipping on your um gin and tonic or your cup of tea, then look out for uh, Patro Toriente, the torrent duck. Now this is the lodge at Macipacuna. The cabanias are just uh, situated a little bit further around the main lodge, and just on the left is where we'll have our meals. The restaurant's right next to it, and the meals are wheeled out uh, or just brought straight out to us. So actually, we can we can have our meals and have a cup of tea. There's a canopy up. Of, there's a uh, um, a second floor up above where there's hammocks and a library and also where you can have a beer, a cerveza or a gin and tonic or a ron, which is a rum, an Ecuadorian rum. So there's plenty of places to relax uh, while you're there. And one of the best things actually is after a long bumpy journey and a dusty, dusty um, uh, car ride, get over the bridge, dump your bags down, have a welcome drink and start bird watching. Colibris or picaflors, hummingbirds, are probably one of my favourite birds. And it, it's the best one in the world, just sitting there with a drink. The birds are not bothered, they're coming in all the time. Bzz, 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 bzz. Just sitting there with a book, with a pair of binoculars, or if you're taking photographs with your camera and snapping away and trying to identify these amazing hummingbirds. Um, we're talking the world epicentre, the western slopes of the cloud forest in Ecuador have got the highest diversity of, of colibris or hummingbirds in the world. Uh, there were 30 species recorded at the reserve. I've seen 28 of them. There's a couple I've not managed to see that have been recorded, but they're absolutely belting. You can see white-necked jacobins here. There's a violet-tailed sylph at the back with a long tail. And I think that one's a green crown brilliant, which is one of the really common ones as well. So colibris or hummingbirds, I mean, just spending the whole time watching them. It's just while I'm watching uber, uber easy which is a nice way to kind of introduce yourself into the cloud forest. Here's a lovely one perching. If you want to get a naturalistic pose of them, that's a nice male white neck Jacobin just waiting for his turn at the sugar feeder. So, I mean, if you don't fancy a walk out, if you want to take it easy, just sit with the hummingbirds, with birds of Ecuador. There it is. I've got my copy right here. It's absolutely flipping massive, 1600 birds. Uh, and fill your heart out with hummingbirds. Um, there are some belters as well. Um, this is one of my favourites. This is a booted racket tail. This is the male, so it's got really tiny, fine filaments of a tail and a little racket right at the end. And it's absolutely minute. It's an absolutely beautiful bird. And that comes down to the feeders too. So you get a chance to see um, booted racket tail, hopefully. Uh, moving on, obviously you've relaxed, you've got into your cabana. I mean, being in a cloud forest is all about enjoying the forest. Uh, the forest walks are amazing. They have lots of what they call senderos or paths or caminos around the trail. Um, I, I can work as a guide because I know a lot of the stuff there, but we'll also probably have a local guide with us. Um, and they can take us on short walks, on short walks, on long walks. We can come back for lunch. Everything is encapsulated within the reserve. And obviously, uh, I think when we're based at uh, Macapuna Lodge, we're about 1,200 metres. And the reserve goes right up to 2,000 metres plus on the ridge tops. So anyone feeling intrepid wants to go and look for something like a toucan barbic can go a bit higher to the, to the higher trails as well. So as much or as little as you want to do. Um, one word that, um, that, that, that you'll learn when you go to the cloud forest is the word called epiphyte. These are plants that live on plants. So they grow on other trees, other plants. And that epiphytic lifestyle is really common in the cloud forest because they're trying to get a leg up so they can access the light from above. Plus also as well, the rain coming down, they can collect the rain. So you get these big aeroid leaves. That's about a metre long. It's in the family Aracia. We have aeroids growing in Britain as garden plants, a little bit like cheese plant, like Monstera. So seeing these big cheese plants uh, up, up canopies is amazing. And of course, Orchids, uh, I mentioned the world headquarters for uh, hummingbirds. It's also got the highest diversity of um, orchids, epiphytic orchids living up in the trees. We've got 57 species of orchid in Britain. They're all terrestrial, not a single one of them lives above ground, but virtually every single species of orchid in the cloud forest lives at altitude. And so you go right up and these branches, these mossy boughs are covered. This is a brassia or a spider orchid. Absolutely stunning, they really are. 
And there's an orchidarium there as well. So because sometimes a branch falls down with some orchids on and the guides will collect it and bring it to the orchidarium. So you can see lots of different species flowering that you might not all normally see when they're 30 meters up in the canopy. I mean, look at that. That is absolutely astonishing, isn't it? That's a Mazdavalia orchid. And it looks like the kind of spider from Mars. So if you like your macro photography, um, then, uh, then you've, got, you've got every chance of taking really lovely pictures of the orchids there. Just fill your boots with those. Um, I mentioned hummingbirds. I mentioned um, orchids, particularly ep epiphytic orchids. The other key group is bromeliads. Um, those who don't know bromeliads, it's the member of the pineapple family. So you get these fantastic bromeliads growing up in the trees. And quite often they'll be strapped to the tree and they'll have these bromeliad tanks that collect water. And that's often where the poison arrow frogs uh, um, mate because it's basically a little tiny reservoir of water up in the tree. This is a species called Picania, a really common species at Macipacuna and really beautiful and photogenic. And this is one of the pictures I took. This is a hand bromeliad, Bromelia de Manu. This is actually a, a species that's really common at Macipacuna and it's the national plant of Ecuador. So you can get a chance to see this wonderful plant there as well. I mean, it's not all about seeing the big things. It's about seeing the cool, sexy plants like this. So orchids, bromeliads, and then you have a little break and see some hummingbirds and tanagers and toucans. So um, just talking about the, the diversity, I mean, the diversity is off the Richter scale, but also as well, this wonderful rule called endemism. Because the cloud forests in Ecuador on the western slopes where Macipacuna is are between, and this narrow, narrow band between about 1200 and about 2000 meters, you get a range of plants that are only found in Northwest Ecuador there and Southwest Colombia. And I was working there and I was working with a chap called Dr. Grady Webster, who is a Californian biologist. And I used to go around I don't, helping him and asking him what all the plants were. And I said, oh, Dr. Webster, what's, what's that plant there? And he said, Norcina or Websteri, named after him because he's identified so many species new to science. He's got one named after him. So you'll see lots of plants that you don't know the name of. I don't know the name of, maybe the guy does, but many of them will be there, found there and nowhere else in the world. It is endemism off the Richter scale in the cloud forest. Um, moving on, lots of medicinal plants as well. This is, um, it's got a fantastic Latin, a fantastic uh, Spanish name. It's called Lengua de Suegra, which means mother-in-law's tongue. I suppose it's got a wicked uh, tip to it. But this is a really important plant because it's got medicinal applications and can help with, um, if anyone's got problems with kidney stones, uh, it's a really useful plant, for example. So lots of medicinal plants because, of course, quinine comes from an Ecuadorian tree uh, in the cloud forests. So, um, you know, lots of medicinal plants, uh, certainly in the forest as well. Um, the birds. I suppose I'm probably best known for being a birder, even though I've been doing a lot of plant spotting over the last couple of years. But the birds really are absolutely sensational though. I've shown you a few hummingbird pictures, but this is one of the birds I really wanted to see when I was there. there. This is a broad-billed motmot, -mot, and it's got a tail a bit like a booted racket tail, but it swings it like a pendulum. It's beautiful. Now, when I was doing a, um, a quick run through with Dan, I've got a few bird calls and I wanted to kind of play a few bird calls. And Dan, unfortunately, couldn't hear them. But hopefully a few of you will be able to hear some of the calls. It depends, I think, on the bandwidth you've got. So hopefully you should be able to hear the call of this bird, which echoes through the cloud forest when you're walking around there. Seeing that bird and hearing that sound is, is tremendous. Um, when I first found out I was going to the cloud forest back in 1993 when I did my master's project on the moths, there was one bird I wanted to see, Gajo de la Peña, the Andean cock of the rock. I mean, in terms of world birds, we have 10,000 of them. I mean, I've seen probably three and a half thousand, but this is one of the world's top 10 birds. It's, uh, it's, um, it's a lecking bird. So the males are stunning. You can see a male here and the females are dull, boring and dowdy. And it's a lecking species like black grouse that we see in Speyside or Kappa Cayley. Um, So the males display um, in, in Scotland, they display on moorland, 
but in the forest here, they're displaying an ancestral lecking tree. And the males, 10 or 15 of them will turn up and they will start flapping these black and silver wings and going. <laughs> the female's watching them and she's like, whatever. So these males are going for it. And they, they generally tend to elect dawn and dusk. So getting a chance to um, get a chance to go and um, and see the lek, we, we've got a really good chance of um, it's a lek probably about an hour and a half away, and it's not it's not too steep. It's a bit of a long way early in the morning, but for those who want to see that bird, come on, you've got to do it. The early bird really does get the worm here, or the early early guest gets the cock of the rock. Anyway, so there we go, Andy and cock of the rock. Um, I mentioned that word endemism again. This bird is an absolute bobby dazzler. It's called a toucan barbit, only found in northwest Ecuador at mid elevations on the western slopes and just a tiny bit in southwest Colombia. So it's almost an endemic bird to Ecuador. And they do an antiphonal duet. So they sit on a branch and just jump up and down and call to each other. The male and female look the same. So once again, hopefully some of you will be able to hear this. If you can't, just look at the bird and just imagine them jumping up and down. <laughs> Now that was the bird I saw a lot of when I was there uh, in April in the cloud forest. So yeah, every chance of seeing what the bird, what the what the Ecuadorians call El Yumbo, the, the uh, cock of the rock. Fantastic. Dan can even hear it as well, which is brilliant. So anyway, with um. We're moving on to the tanagers. Um, when you go to New, when you go to the North America, you can hear the New World warbler. You can see the New World warblers, and they're really beautiful, like Wilson's warbler, golden wing warbler, hooded warbler, Tennessee's warbler. Uh, forget that. In the neotropics, in the in cloud forest, you get a massive diversity of tanagers or tangaras, as the Ecuadorians call them. And this is paradise tanager. I mean, look at that. It's just, you can't actually see the best part of it, which is a really red rump. It's an absolute belter of a bird. And a bit like in Britain, when you go in the forests in winter, you see these mixed flocks moving through the canopy. And all of a sudden you're in tanager heaven. It's like paradise tanager. And then you look over here and it's like golden tanager. I mean, all these wonderful birds you can get to grips with. I mean, I love nothing more than just sitting with my book and a pair of binoculars and just trying to clock them off and trying to get as, as many species as possible. So tanagers, once again, far more tanagers, for example, in the cloud forest than you will see in the Amazon, which is a re really interesting. So they love those cloud forests on the Western slopes in El Occidente. Um, toucans. The reason why I was really into, uh, into South America as a kid was because my first ever drink in a pub was, was Guinness. And for some reason, I can never work out why uh, a South American bird advertises an Irish drink brewed on the Liffey. Um, you know, Guinness is good for you with, with, a, with a toucan. So I really wanted to see toucans when I was there. Um, and this is a little mini toucan. It's called a toucanette. You can, should just be able to see that crimson rump. So it's a crimson rump toucanette. I saw loads of these when I was there in April. I mean, they're just, you never, you never thrill of seeing them. It's probably just slightly bigger than a pint pot, the actual body, and then the tail would obviously have to stick out the side or something. But I mean, what a bird. Just, it just hangs around in the canopy. Just all of a sudden you look up and there's a bird like a crimson rump to connect, which is, which is out of this world. Beautiful. Um, so there we are. That's the kind of some of the slopes in Maki Pacuna. You can see a few of the little pastas as the deforested areas. And you can see that cloud sitting in that forest. It's really beautiful. So if you go much higher up, you see a much bigger toucan and a much rarer toucan. This is plate build mountain toucan but it's often found a little bit higher. So for those that want to go a little bit higher onto the ridge tops, then it's not, you know, it's not, not a long walk. You've got every chance of seeing and a lamnirostris, the plate bill mountain toucan. Now that is a really rare bird, but the places like Maki Pacuna is its epicenter. So good chance of seeing something like a plate bill mountain toucan. I mean, I, it's not a terribly exciting picture, but I just love that. I mean, look at the diversity of plants. You've got palms, You've got melastomes, you've got all man, you've got mosses, you've got all manner of forests. And so when you're walking those senderos, those, um, those paths, then you get a chance to kind of ex uh, just see a thousand shades of green. 
in these forests. It's, they're, they're really, really stunning. Um, lots of butterflies, mariposas. I did my project on moths, uh, and a lot of the butterflies are impossible to identify. Uh, just enjoy them. <laughs> um, because also, as well, a lot of the butterflies practice mimicry. So butterflies that are non-poisonous will try to look like poisonous butterflies and confuse you. I've got butterflies of Costa Rica and there's hundreds of species and Ecuador is much, much weaker, richer than Costa Rica. But there is one butterfly that's really easy to identify and it's this one, it's Mariposa Ochenta Inueve, which translates as butterfly 89. So if you see that one, you know that one straight away, an easy one to identify. Uh, lots of really interesting butterflies as well. So the uh, Mariposa Ochenta Inueve you'll see in the open areas, but this is a real forest butterfly. It flits around the sunny glades where the sun's coming through. And this is one of the ethomiid or glasswing butterflies. And seeing these in the cloud forest is really beautiful. I mean, their wings are completely translucent. And there's new species being found to science recently. There's a paper written, it was on the BBC website, talking about all these glass wings that have um, been found in the cloud forest. So yeah, um, species still to be found there. Um, You'll notice, actually, I haven't talked a lot about mammals. Um, there, are, there are one or two monkeys there, but most of it's going to be hummingbirds, toucans, tanagers, orchids and bromeliads, and just enjoying the spectacular vistas from the cloud forest. But there is a chance of seeing Jaguarundi. I've seen Jaguarundi a few times there. Um, they do occasionally get spectacle bears. Um, the nearest I've come to spectacle bear, and I hope I'm going to get, I hope I'm going to write that wrong on this trip, is, um, is seeing the vegetation shake as a spectacle bear ran off. But certainly it's chance of seeing something like Jaguarundi. So um, we'll spend, I think, probably about three nights, four days in Mackey, and then we'll go up to Pimampiro, which is the gateway, one of three gateways to Cotacach, sorry, to um, Kayambi Coca uh, National Park. Now, Kayambi uh, Coca, uh, sorry, ecological reserve, is absolutely massive. It's something like 400,000 hectares. And it's on, effectively, if I remember that letter M, it's on the eastern slopes, but it's very much higher up than we were at the cloud forest. So here we are at Parque Nacional Cayambi Coca. Um, so we'll get a chance to kind of, you know, when we see a sign, we know we're going into this fantastic reserve. And look at that. We're in the Paramo here. So we're above the tree line where you get the giant groundsels, the Senecios. Um, and you can see, um, uh, you can see uh, Kayambi in the background. And this is the third highest mountain. It's permanently in, in snow. This is the third highest mountain in Ecuador. I think it's 5,790. I've climbed the second highest, which is Cotopaxi. And then Chimborazo is much higher. That's over 6,000, 6,300, I think. And that's flipping hardcore. Um, but going up here into this amazing high altitude grassland is, is wonderful. And there's a couple of species that we really want to see here. It's not got the diversity of the Amazon or the richness of the cloud forest. But what it has is two absolute mega species. Um, but you'll see along the way while we're looking for these mega species, you'll see lots of plants that you might be familiar with, like Ericaceous ericus shrubs like um, heath, heathland type plants. It's almost like in, part, in some ways you're in a Dorset heathland or you're on the Lizard Peninsula. But then again, you're kind of two and a half, three thousand meters up. So an amazing landscape. And that is what we're going for. Um, we've got, a, we've, we're pretty much sure we've sourced an area where bears are incredibly, incredibly well seen and really regular. And um, we're very much hoping if we spend two nights at uh, uh, homestays uh, in uh, Kayambi Coca Reserve, we're going to get a chance to catch up with spectacle bears. I mean, it is Paddington. And it it's not quite from deepest, darkest Peru. It's deepest, darkest, darkest Ecuador. But this is probably the species that I most want to see in the world. I spent a year and a half in Ecuador and I've just got to write that wrong. So I'm really, really keen. And this place we think we've found, which I've, I've never been to, I've been to Kayambi before, but never been to these homestays and this area is as good as anywhere where you're gonna get a chance to see spectacle bear, or as they call it in Ecuador, osos anteojos, which is uh, bear with spectacles. Um, look at that, isn't that wonderful? Can you imagine just looking up and seeing that? 
I may well just die, metaphorically die and go to heaven if I see this species. It is probably the animal I most want to see in the world, full stop, right there. So anyway, that's the one key species that we want to see. The other one is another mega. Uh, hopefully a few of you are able to hear this. I've got a little montage of music. All these are my pictures that I took um, of uh, the Andean condor. So we're going there for two species. We'll see lots of others, but I, hopefully you can hear this music. I'll play a little montage of um, panpipe music because every time I go to Ecuador and I see an Andean condor, I always think of the old, the old panpipes. So there's a little montage of my um, of my of, of my uh, California, uh, sorry, Ecuadorian condors, uh, and here we go. Bears, condors, yes, please. There we go, isn't that wonderful? So anyway, we'll nip back to Quito after having spent an amazing time up in the Paramo, and then we'll drop right down into the Amazon. Um, we're hopefully going to visit uh, Napo Wildlife Center, which is a really well-known site. So we'll go to Quito, fly to Puerto Francisco de Orellana, or as they call it, Coca, which was an old um, petrolero town. Um, and then we'll take a boat, all the way down the Rio Napo, the Napo River, to the Napo Wildlife Center. Now there's two really big, huge reserves in the, uh, what they call the Oriente or the Amazonia in Ecuador. There's uh, south of the, so north of the river, there's Cuyabeno, Parque Nacional Cuyabeno, and south there's Parque Nacional Yasuni. And it's Yasuni, the biosphere reserve that we'll be going into. Um, what a place, I mean, look at that. Um, you know, I said earlier on, some people like the tropics, some people like um, Africa, African plains, some people like um, the polar regions. I like that. That is my favourite habitat. And it's just beautiful, the diversity. And we're talking hundreds of species of trees. But I, think the, I think the number of birds at, at Napa Rio Lodge is something like 560 species of bird. I mean, that, that reserve has got something like 5% of all the world bird species on its list. I mean, it's astonishing, really. So here we are. Uh, when we when we fly down to uh, to Coca, uh, we'll, we'll 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 get on a well. We'll get into the boat and we'll canoe all the way down to the Rio Napo. And this is up to the Napo Wildlife Centre. And this is it here with the lodges, the lovely lodges, and you've got a tower as well. You also get a chance to um to uh, to go around the fantastic uh, Laguna there. And this is a really brilliant project because it's run by the local indigenous community of the Anyangu Kichwa community. So it's not kind of Westerners coming in and kind of taking all the money that we, we provide. I mean, the local people, the local indigenous people benefit from our visits to these sites, which is really, really important. These local guides, local cooks. I mean, it's run by native, native indigenous Ecuadorians, for native indigenous Ecuadorians for the betterment. And that's the only way you're gonna protect these forests. If the local people are invested in protecting them, then the wildlife and, and the habitat and the wildlife is gonna do really well. So really fantastic project. I think there's some, I've been close to here. I've never actually been to Napo Wildlife Center. I've been to Yasuni and Cuyabeno. I stayed at a slightly different place when I was there. Um, but I think there's something like 50, 50 guests can be um, accommodated here. Um, and it's right by the um, Anyangu uh, uh, Anyango Cocha Lake or Anyango Cocha, Cocha is lake. And so we'll get a chance to, um, to paddle around um, and see lots of wildlife. Because sometimes 
wildlife, tropical forest is quite difficult to see stuff. I remember the first time I ever went, I thought, there's 500 species of bird here. I'm going to see 300 this morning. And I identified about four or five on my own. Um, but one way of seeing lots of stuff really easy is by canoeing back down the Aguas Negras or the black waters. Uh, so you canoe all around these lovely areas and um, you get a chance to see amazing, amazing things. So here we are in our canoes. One of the first birds we're, we'll see is Hawatsin. I mean, what an ancient bird. It's in its own genus of species. Uh, it's in its own genus. There's no other species like it. It's got this amazing, amazing, crazy mohawk. Um, and if it's scared, its natural reaction is not to fly away, but just to dive into the water and go underwater. And it's got these hooks on its wings. It like climbs up into the trees with its hooks. It's an absolutely astonishing bird. So while we're canoeing past, we will definitely see a few Horatsons with a bit of luck. Um, lots of kingfishers. Uh, we saw the kingfishers last week when we were in the Somerset Levels and I, I was, I never take a kingfisher for granted. We've only got one species here. And we were probably talking about six or seven in this one site. This is the Amazonian or Amazon kingfisher. Um, and these are often perching by the rivers, by the Aguas Negras, the black waters. They call them black waters because they're full of tannins that have soaked out of the soil into the water. So the water itself is not crystal clear at all. It's like it's like tea once you're taking the tea bag out without putting the milk in. Um, but they, these these somehow these kingfishers can find enough food to survive there. And it's good fun. Once again, with the book, trying to identify them and also as well trying to take photographs of them. Uh, El Lobo del Rio, the giant river otter. Uh, one of my favorite animals. Um, prior, to, um, prior to working on the one show, I worked as um, assistant, um, a field assistant for a series called Andes to Amazon because I spoke fluent Spanish. So I would go out as a camera assistant with a cameraman, a very well-known cameraman called Charlie Hamilton James. And we spent six weeks, sorry, uh, yeah, six weeks filming giant river otters. Oh my word, what an amazing animal. They're so charismatic. They go, <laughs> they stick their heads up like little periscopes. And for film, for camera people, they're brilliant because they get up about nine or 10 o'clock in the morning. You don't have to get up too early. They'll play around in the water. They'll catch a piranha. They'll rip it to bits. They'll play with their cubs. They'll go and have a siesta in the middle of the day. And then they'll come out in the afternoon and they'll be more entertaining and engaging, playing with their cubs, beating up the caimans and Joe and having an amazing time. And you can identify the individual animals by their throat patches. So El Lobo del Rio. El Lobo is the wolf and Rio is river. So it's the wolf of the water. I mean, caimans are scared of them. These guys are gnarly. They're two meters long. They will kick a caiman's backside. They'll eat, they'll eat piranhas for breakfast. And yeah, one of the top species you want to see here. I mean, look at that. Gorgeous. Hopefully as well. Um, I know a lot of you have probably been uh, with Wildlife and Wider, other companies. Took it to the Pantanal um, uh, for going for Jaguar. And there's, there's a chance of seeing a Jaguar. Well, certainly while we're there, I know it's easy at the Pantanal because they're sitting out by the river. Uh, but also as well, we'll certainly see some, um, some uh, what do they call swamp dogs. I forget, I forget the common name for them. Anyway, they're the biggest rodents in the world. Um, agoutis. No, no, agoutis are smaller. Anyway, you know what they are. Capybara, thank you. Uh, capybaras. So we should get a chance to see a few capybaras while we're in the Laguna or we're around the Aguas Negras. So looking out for those would be brilliant. And of course, the black caiman. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They make this amazing noise at night uh, and they make the water dance around them. You just see them gliding past. Beautiful. Um, a, a good chance as well when you're looking up, of course, is you kind of see lots of sky. When you're in the forest, it's hard to see the birds above. But when you're canoeing, don't just look at the water, at the giant river waters. You need to remember to look up. And then you might see a chance, have a chance of seeing many of the raptors or birds of prey. And this is swallowtail kite, which is one of the top birds. Anyway, there we go. Um, so we're moving on uh, into the rainforest. I'm walking here much flatter. There's a different feel in the, in the, in the Oriente, in the rainforest. It's a lot hotter. It's a lot more humid. The, bird, the, the diversity is higher and the guides are amazing at finding stuff. So they can find stuff that you wouldn't believe. I mean, when I went to Madagascar for the first time with, a, with Wildlife World in September, I couldn't believe how good the guides were. I thought I was a good naturalist. They were just finding amazing stuff. So the local community guides who've lived all their lives and worked there 
will also um, will will also be guiding us, and they get a chance to show, show some amazing stuff. And so you might not see many mammals in the cloud forest, but there's eleven species of monkey in Yasuni. I think actually I think recorded a Napa Wildlife Centre. So this is a white-fronted uh, capuchin, uh, day, a, day, a, a diurnal monkey, go around in troops. And this is one of everyone's favourites, the little squirrel monkeys. They're common all over the Oriente, all over the Amazon. It's another diurnal monkey. Um, so we should get a chance of seeing, certainly I would think eight or nine species of monkey, hopefully a few more. I mean, look at that, beautiful saddle-backed tamarind. These go around in little family troops with a dominant male, and a dominant female, and often the the young from previous generations. I mean, they're dinky uh, and they're gorgeous, and uh, we've got every chance of seeing them. Um, moving on, of course, to, to an animal I know very well, the howler monkey. Uh, we get howler monkeys in the cloud forest, but also as well, there's different species of howler monkey. This is red man. This is red howler monkey. You get them, you get them in the in the Amazon as well. And hearing their call as they call as the different um, uh, troops call to each other, it's like a kind of and their throat resonates, opens up to this huge gular pouch, and the call goes through the trees and can travel for two, three, four kilometers. So you'll definitely get a chance to hear the um, the howler monkeys going for it, probably at dawn and dusk when you're when you're spending time at the Napa Wildlife Center. Certainly, a chance to see sloths as well. Um, I, I saw lots of them are, uh, in Costa Rica. The sloth certainly by the forest in the cecropia trees near the water. Uh, so this is a two-toed sloth. You can see they've got two toes in their four, four limbs. And there's a three-toed sloth, which has got three toes in its four limbs. And this was really distinctive because it looks a little bit like a clown's face as well. So there we go. Um, lots of forest birds. I mean, oh my word. There'll be so many birds you can't identify or you see a bit of and you don't get, get on. But that's, that's part of the fun. That's why I love it so much. I'm always going to see new stuff, always going to see amazing birds. And this is one of the world's finest songsters. This is the musician Wren. And what it does is it just walks around the forest, hardly ever flies, singing away as it walks. Uh, I know some of you still might not be able to hear it, but hopefully a few will be able to hear this song, because when you hear this song, it's just, it's just amazing. And then hopefully you get a chance to catch a sight of it. So this is the song of the musician Wren. What a bird, one of the many birds that it just spends its life on the forest floor. And then when you go deep into the forest and that's what the forest walks will offer, you get a chance to see. Uh, one of my favorite birds, common potu, half bird, half branch. Um, it's got the most amazing call. It calls at night. It's not turned, it's a bit like a night jar, I suppose you could say, or an Asiatic frog mouth. Um, and they go, ah! Um, and the, the locals are amazing at finding these. I've never found one on my own. And I've always had someone go, there's one, because they just know how to look for them and where to look for them. And look at that, that's a potu with the moon behind, calling away. And what a bird, you'll definitely hear, get a chance to hear those. And so in the cloud forest, you see the toucanet, and here you see the big chunky toucan. This is channel bill toucan. We well, certainly should be able to see these quite often flying over the rivers, or when we go to the clay licks, flying around there. Anyway, you get a chance to kind of get high up and there's a tower at the Napa Wildlife Center. That's a really good place to find the toucans because the toucans are in the tops of the trees, feeding on the fruit. And that's when you get, it's a real benefit to get high up in the forest because then you're looking down at the wildlife with the sun on the back of your head. So all of a sudden they look beautiful colors. And these are brilliant when you're to fly because they've got really heavy beaks so they go like this. They can't fly too long before their bill just slightly drags them down. Um, we'll definitely get a chance to see some toucans. And um, I can't guarantee a pint of Guinness there, though, unfortunately. Um, what are the real features of Napa Wildlife Centre? And a lot of the places in the Amazon, in Ecuador, Peru and Colombia, is the clay licks. So a lot of these birds are eating fruits and nuts, which they, they don't, they, they quite often build up a lot of toxins. So they have to have clay to detoxify. 
all those toxins that are built up. So a lot of the parrots will go to clay licks and that's the place where you see big congregations of parrots where you hopefully see the macaws. This is a scarlet macaw. There's also a red and green macaw, which looks really similar, only it hasn't got that bit of yellow in the um, uh, in its wing, in its, in, its, um, in its covets there. So getting a chance to see that. I mean, that bird is like a metre long. They're flipping massive. I mean, seeing one of those fly past and they're really noisy as well. They've got this screeching call to say, I'm coming, I'm coming, get me your cameras ready, get your binoculars ready. Here I'm coming. So they're really super birds. And this is a clay lip, for example, here we've got blue-headed Amazons, mealy Amazons. So you get a chance to visit one of these clay licks where they're coming down and, you know, we're using that beat to kind of get some of that clay down and some of the salts to, to try and, and sort their digestive issues out. Really, really a, a key part. And sometimes as well, you can even see these like tapirs at the clay lick. So other animals are coming down to use that lick as well, particularly early and later on in the day. Um, I've seen a harpy eagle only a couple of times in my life in, in my time in Ecuador, but you've got to be in it to win it, I always say. Um, and this is the world's most impressive bird of prey. I don't care what, what you say about African martial eagle, Stella's sea eagle, golden eagle. Check out that bad boy. It's not the biggest, but it's the most powerful. It's got short, relatively short wings, not like a big Stella seagull or golden eagle or white-tailed eagle, but my word, it's powerful. It can grab a sloth or a monkey from the trees. Um, what a bird. So I've seen one in Peru, I've seen one in Colombia, and I quite like to see one in Ecuador, please, if you don't mind. Um, one animal you certainly will see is the leafcutter ants. Uh, the leafcutter ants are absolutely fantastic animals. Um, so uh, everywhere you go, you'll see leafcutter ants carrying these little bits of um, little bits of leaf. And what they do is they they take them back the leaf the, the bits of leaf and they chew them up, and they create this, they grow this fungus. And this fungus is found nowhere else in the world apart from inside the leafcutter ant leafcutter ants nest Atacephalotes. Um, and so seeing these dum 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 through the forest is something that you'll you'll perceive really easily. And you're, you're never tired of seeing. And they're marching kind of along twigs or on the branch. Um, it's just it's just a really, really common sight and something that's really a, a very typical Amazonian sight. And hopefully we'll see one of the world's most impressive butterflies as well, morphos. The uh, first time I ever saw one is I couldn't believe it. It's like it's like two halves, it's like two tennis bats going past you. Um, it's and, and I think Frank Lambert is one of a really well-known um, Amazonian biologists call this the bluest thing in the world. And he's absolutely right. It's got a metallic blue sheen. I mean, God, what a beautiful butterfly. Absolutely fantastic. And um, also lots of snakes. We might get a chance to see Ferdinand Lance. We might get a chance to see all manner of really exciting snakes. This is one of the Imantodes, the blunt-headed vine snake. Um, I love snakes. I never find them because I'm too busy looking for birds. But that's what we've got local guides for. They'll hopefully be able to show us a few really cool snakes. Uh, I'm almost there. We're, we're going to stop off before we get back to Quito. Lots of, I mean, reptiles and amphibians, uh, a huge number as well. We should get a chance to find some poison arrow frogs while we're there. And here's a picture of me with a little strawberry poison arrow frog. I mean, what a beautiful little animal to try and, um, try and use your new macro lens for. So that's really the Amazon. So we'll come back. And after kind of in a hot, sweaty time in the Amazon, what better way than to relax in a thermal spring? So we'll go back up, we'll drive back up to Papajecta or Papayacta, and we'll go into the hot springs there. And we'll get a chance to cool off at altitude in these amazing hot springs. Really wonderful place. It is Laguna or Lake Papajacta. And um, yeah, once again, when you have a look at the lake, you can go from the dip if you want, because you've worked really hard. You've worked in the cloud forest. You've looked for spectacle bears and condors. You've walked all around the Amazon and you are entitled to have a bathe afterwards. But I don't know about you, I'm not very good at bathing, really. I'm just a bit ants in my pants. I want to go and say, well, what's that bird in the tree? So we might be able to visit Guango Lodge, which I was there in April. And it's just the most amazing place for hummingbirds. Just outside Papa Jacta, we can go there for half a day, for a day. Just have another little dose of hummingbirds. A completely different set of hummingbirds to the western slopes, because we're on the eastern slopes here. You get a chance to see um, other birds as well, like Masked Trogon and um, Turquoise Jay. But also as well, you'll sit there and you'll wait for one particular hummingbird, an absolute belter. 
uh, and it's not that one. That's um, uh, uh, chestnut fronted coronet. So there you are, chestnut uh, fronted coronet. So there you are waiting, chestnut fronted coronet, chestnut fronted coronet, long tail sylph, um, all manner of birds coming in. And then this arrives, the sword billed hummingbird. When I saw this for the first time in April, I just, I just was so, so thrilled. It is the world's longest bill in proportion to the bird. I mean, what an astonishing bird. I mean, cock of the rock and saw bill hummingbird. And it's got the long, it's right, it's, and it's got this long bill because it feeds, it takes nectar from the devil's trumpets, the Solanaceae, Brugmansia. Um, some, of, some of you can grow some of them in, in the UK, the, the devil's trumpets that hang down. And the hummingbird, so this, the, the hummingbird uses that long bill to get into the nectar is right at the back. What a bill! It's astonishing. So there we are, uh, back in Quito, and that's the end of the adventure. So what I will say before I hand back to Dan and ask any answer any questions, um, obviously you know that I do. I, I'm doing Madagascar again this year. I'm doing. I'm doing uh, just as the Somerset levels. I've got a trip uh, to the Scottish Highlands in March coming up. It's it's um it's got a few spaces left. So if anybody fancies a chance um, to go and see pine martins, golden eagles, red quil squirrels, crested tits, staying in an amazing place in Speyside, then please do come. And I'll tell you, anybody who comes who wants to go, who's also going to go to Ecuador, I will give you a free Spanish lesson. How about that? Dan, <laughs> over to you. Mike, I, I don't know how to follow that. That, that was absolutely outstanding. Um, your knowledge <laughs> of Ecuador, <laughs> absolutely superb. I, 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 that. I loved every minute of that. Well done, mate. Well done. Brilliant. Well, I, it's a country I'm incredibly passionate about, and it's not a country like, oh, yeah, I'll take guests there and I'll look after them, but I don't know the country. I know this country really well. Yeah, that, that, that really came across, Mike. That, that was absolutely superb. Uh, lovely comments coming in as well from, from the guys that have attended tonight. Um, just the diversity of the place. It's ridiculous, isn't it? I, I was trying to think, you know, what is the standout species here? And like one minute it's the cock of the rock and then it's the sword billed, you know, hummingbird. And then, well, there's a chance of harpy eagle and then swallowtail kite. And you just, so many iconic birds. It, it, it's nuts. Um, the diversity is off the, off the Richter scale. Yeah. I mean, even the orchids are amazing and they're really easily seen because it's a fantastic orchidarium. And so yeah. uh, Maki Bakuna has got 250 different species of identified orchid. I mean, we've got 50 in Britain. I mean, in a, in a reserve, nice. like about 5,000 hectares. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's a fantastic supporting supporting cast. But, you know, hopefully we'll get a chance to see Cockle of Ox and Spectacle Bears and Andean Condors and then Sawbill Hummingbird and, and some of the Amazonian specialities like Giant River Otter. So, yeah, loads and loads to see. And I'm really, really excited to, to hopefully kind of offer this to, to the guests uh, coming yeah. up. Absolutely, Mike. Do you, do you want us to flick to the next slide? And what I'll also do now, very quickly, guys, if you bear with me, is I'll just launch the poll, um, just so that if um, if what you've seen tonight is of interest, and if you did fancy joining Mike in it, um, you're, you're welcome to request uh, a copy of the itinerary when that's finished. We expect to have that finished in the next week or two. Um, I've also just listed a, a trip there to uh, Ecuador with Nick Garbutt and um, Alex Hyde. Um, Nick's a very good friend of Mike's as well. Um, but that's a very well. <laughs> that's, that's obviously a photography focused trip. So um, if you're that way inclined, um, then that's a super option as well. And we're, we're happy to send both out. Um, but Mike, as you might expect, we have got some questions for you. So oh, we'll be happy to help Dan. Yeah, let me let me. I've already got some noted down, and then I've also got a few just on the forum as well. The first one um, was from Claudine Smith. She's just asked about the altitude, whether that's likely to be a problem for people. Um, obviously, we go up to, I think we're going up to what, around 3,000 metres, maybe three and a half thousand? I think certainly, um, it, we, and Quito is a really good, a really good introduction because we get there and it's 2,850 metres. And some people will find the air a bit thin, they'll find they have to take it easy for a day, we'll spend a day and a night in Quito. And actually, interestingly enough, when we go to the cloud forest in Maki Pacuna, we drop right off. So we go from 2,800 meters, and we won't be doing much. We'll be having a little gentle poodle around Quito, and then we'll drop down um, to something somewhere between 1,200 meters and 2,000 meters, where if you spent a bit of time in Quito, you won't feel the altitude at all. Um, and I think what the, the, what's run out of Cayambi Coco is a really efficient operation where we are quite high, 
but we won't be doing a lot of walking. We'll be going to locations, viewpoints, where, where the, our, our local hosts, our local guides know really well. So we won't be kind of hammering up really steep slopes with very thin air. Um, but yeah, some will undoubtedly feel it when they get there. Um, uh, and, um, but, you know, we've got time to, uh, time to acclimatise. And certainly we're really, really low in the Oriente, in the Amazon. And then at Papiacta, we're up again at just over 2,000 metres. So there is a bit of a variation. But, I mean, we're taking it easy on these trips. It's great this is it, yeah. We always sit and watch hummingbirds or, um, um, or, or look at the orchid, orchid um, garden if you don't fancy a walk up, uh, walk up the slopes. So there's something for everyone, really. No, we, we, it's important to note. There's a there's a couple of comments to this effect, Mike. That you know, how, how physical are the walks and so forth? How, you know, what's the, the the altitude likely to be like, and, and how much of a challenge is that? But we really are as much as possible trying to design this trip for everybody, aren't we? So that if there is the option for a, a more strenuous walk, then there absolutely will be a, a softer option available as well. You know, whether that's sitting with the hummingbird feeders or a, a, a you know a, a an easier trail or whatever. Um, there's, there's really good easy trails because uh, when I must say, when me and Dan had a, had a meeting discuss this a, a few weeks ago and try and hammer out this itinerary, which is looking pretty tight already, um, and we've already got dates in for April 2024. Um, we looked at an opportunity to go to Santa Lucia. We decided that was an amazing place, but just a little bit too difficult. And the great thing is about this place is you're in the forest at the lodge, and there are there are paths that are pretty flat. Um, and paths that are really easy, nice circular routes that you can do in an hour or two gently. They have a, they have a Sendero Otiguiado, which is an auto-guided trail. So you can do that on your own if you want to, just a little gentle poodle with, with things to point out along the way. So it, it is as much or as little as you want. I mean, hopefully there'll be a chance to kind of go a little bit higher, but the trails are really good. Uh, and usually um, I, I end up just being in Wellington boots the whole time. Wellington boots are walking boots. and they've got lots of pairs of wellington boots uh, out there so you can use your wellington boots you can use your walking boots um you know it is a rainforest it does get wet but i, I never use a waterproof because it's so warm i just love getting because you know as soon as you've kind of got wet it's so warm you're dry again 20 minutes afterwards so um the, the climate really is pretty good there it'll rain quite a lot but generally it's quite predictable so it, it will generally be clear in the morning and it'll rain later in the afternoon it's weird you can almost put a clock to it so we'll kind of go out in the morning, we'll do our walks, and then we'll do something perhaps a little bit more local based in the in the afternoon. But it is quite predictable. And yeah, the trails, trails are easy and the climate is very manageable and they are very used to dealing with tourists of all abilities at Maki Bakuna. Absolutely, thank you, Mike. Um, Marilyn Scott has just asked about the homestays, Mike. Um, you know, how simple are they? Are you literally just staying with a family or is it, you know, is it a little bit more than that? And, and in truth, it is. It, it, they're called homestays, but it's more of a guest house kind of setup. Um, some of the rooms, you know, may well be en suite. Some may be shared bathrooms, but, you know, it's not luxurious, but it's perfectly comfortable. The food's good and, you know, you're very well looked after. You know, that's probably the best way to describe it, isn't it? I, I think so. I mean, we're, 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 we're think, we're, at the moment, we're looking at spending two nights um, in, in KMB Coke in the homestays. We'll spend probably three nights in, in Mackey. We'll probably spend two nights at Canby Coca in the homestays and we'll spend four nights um, in Rio Napo, which is really lovely with en suites. Um, and then obviously we'll be in Papayacta for a couple of nights as well, just looking at sorbel hummingbirds and bathing. Um, but yeah, the homestays, I mean, I, I've, I've personally not seen the homestays. That's the, my one area that I don't know as well. But my understanding is from chatting to the guys is that it's um it's going to be it's going to be really comfortable and also as well we're putting money in the local people's pockets which is absolutely brilliant and it will be it will be a, a really good standard there may be some some sharing of bathrooms but it's worth it for spectacle bears absolutely absolutely spectacle bears yeah yeah amazing um mike what else have we got here um peter barton has asked about best camera gear i don't know if we're best place to answer that, um, I, I would probably suggest like a 100 to 400 is is quite a, a versatile lens to have out there. I would also suggest a macro lens. Um, but in all honesty, if you want a bit more detail on that, then obviously Nick Garbett and, and, and Alex Hyde are, are probably your best bet. And we can always put that question to them in, unless you've got anything to add there, Mike. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, and I, 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 
obviously kind of Nick and Alex do photography safaris and I do wildlife, principally wildlife watching trips, but I'm always happy to accommodate photographers and, and I want to get photographers getting the best pictures. And, and most people these days, even for really keen birders, they want to get photographs as well. Um, I would say, I mean, I've got a 7D, I've got a 300 mil with a, with a 1.4 converter. I'd rather have 100 to 400 telephoto, uh, which I want to hopefully kind of grade, grade up, up to by the time I go there. And I use my 100 mil macro all the time. I mean, flash photography is a really difficult one anyway, and it can be quite dark in the forest. Um, but usually we kind of show sh slow shutter speeds, or if you've got a ring flash, then you get a chance to take really good pictures of things like the um, uh, poison arrow frogs. I bet, you know, the, my orchid pictures, they've all been taken. I mean, I, I sometimes I take a little tripod just to get or a monopod, just to give a little bit of solidity so I can drop that shutter speed down because the light levels can be quite low. So if you don't want to use a flash, or haven't brought one. Um, but obviously, you know, if you want to take amazing pictures of the vistas of the cloud forest, then a nice wide angle, well, I'm not suggesting a fisheye lens, but a nice wide angle lens will certainly help. But I think the, the regular stuff that you would normally bring, um, and then it's just, it's, it's what you do. Do you look at the bird? Do you photograph it? Do you write about it? <laughs> I mean, it's just, I'll be using my binoculars first and foremost and my camera just a second, but. I know for some people it's the other way around, but I think pretty much, I think you've covered the bases there. And I don't know whether Nick and Alex would say anything differently at all. They'll be able to give you more specific gen on, on precise F-stops or, 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 or Alex certainly on the more yeah. complicated aspects of the macro photography. Yeah. But certainly I can help out to a certain extent. Good man. No, thank you, Mike. Um, we've got a question here. Um, John Evans wants to put you on the spot. What's what's the best bird in Ecuador? Christ. Um Gajo de la Peña, Andean Cock of the Rock. It's got yeah. it is, yeah. it's the Andean Cock of the Rock. <laughs> it's quite future pink. It's got a funky crest, it's got yellow legs, it's got a white eye. It's, I mean, it's got a lot going for it. Yeah. Top three, Andean Cock of the Rock, Sawbill Hummingbird, Andean Condor. Have it. Yeah. For me, it's the sword billed hummingbird. I've I've seen that you know images of that bird so many times. You know we've used them on on you know advertising and stuff. Um, obviously, see them in Colombia as well. So um, we've had some success there and seen the photos that guests have taken of them. And it yeah, it just blows me away every time. You know, just to well, see, wait, I saw them at the Tulo story Bay. behind it as well, the adaptation. You know how it's oh, come it's, about. It's astonishing. I mean, we saw them at Guangal Lodge, and I also saw them at um, a reserve just outside Quito which we could easily just kind of, you know, we went up there for two hours and went, walked up, two hours, um, uh, saw, saw the hummingbird. Um, so we can potentially see them very close to Quito. I mean, just outside Quito as well. So yeah, I mean, saw the hummingbird, absolute belter, yeah. Brilliant stuff, mate. I, I, think, I think we're almost there with the, with the questions for now. Um, there's lots of lovely comments coming in. So thank you so much for everybody that's joined us. Thank you us. so much. Really um, appreciate you spending a bit of your time and, I mean, it, you know, yeah. I, I just want to share the passion of the country. And um, if, you, if you enjoy the evening, great. If you want to come, even better. But I'm just glad you're, glad you're able to join us. Thank, thank you ever so much, Mike. Um, I don't know if there's another slide after this. Um, just... There we go. Yes, there we go. Um, we will, um, as ever, be in touch with any of the travel plans that you've requested um, for, for Mike's trip when that's available, or indeed for, for Nick and Alex's. Um, and if there's any questions which I have missed, um, do forgive me, um, but we will get onto them tomorrow morning, uh, if necessary, run them by Mike and uh, be in touch as soon as we can. But thank just you. To say, just to say, Dan, as well, <laughs> I've, already put, I've already put dates in. Uh, we're looking at the 13th to the 28th of April 2024 is when we're hoping to go, which is a brilliant time to go. So we're talking probably uh, two travel days and you know a good two weeks to fully immerse yourself in and everything that the cloud forest, the Amazon, and the Paramo have to offer. Fantastic. It's, it's going to be an incredible trip, mate. Um, we will get there with it. We will hopefully have that with you shortly. Um, obviously, we have got a special offer should you decide to, to book on that trip, uh, or indeed Nick or Alex's uh, trip. Um, and obviously, that offer will be extended uh, to the point where, you know, where we've got that itinerary up and running so that you can have a look at that and consider that. Uh, and take advantage of that discount code if you want. But um, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you so much for everybody for joining us tonight and uh, enjoy the rest of your evenings. And um, hopefully we'll see you next week.